All right, these are crazy times, and this is a podcast episode that's been sitting on my shelf since the beginning of the year, and uh, with a little extra free time, I've been able to finish all the uh, parts and pieces and polish it up and make it sound like I want it to sound. It is from a moment that was very happy in my life. It's got a lot of the things in it that make me happy. It's got my child. It's got... 18,000 screaming fans. It's got a whole bunch of microphones and it just made me happy. So here's a little ray of sunshine for you. Hi, boy. Come here. You awake? Yeah. At least I got awake with you. Yeah? Awake. You want some breakfast? I want some breakfast. What would you like? Mm, I don't know. So what am I going to do at the hockey game? Moving around at the hockey game. Just moving around? And recording. What am I recording? The hockey stuff. We're recording the crowd. What? Why? Because there's a lot more people at this game. So you're recording the crowd? Mm-hmm. But why? Because they only do this game once a year. Only the final game once a year. You're listening to Tone Benders, the sound designer's podcast. Let's do this. So, <clears throat> last night was New Year's Eve. Just about everybody stayed up all the way until midnight. I didn't stay up all the way until midnight. So watch the new year come in. I didn't stay up either. I had to get a good night's rest. So I could wake up early today and get ready for this hockey game. And look, I'm wearing long johns. See, I've got long sleeves underneath my shirt. And I've got long sleeves underneath my pants. But I'm wearing long pants and long sleeves. Not even a single long shorts. Um, it shows that you're going to the hockey game. Mm-hmm. So basically, any time you go to a hockey game, you're going to wear that. My star shirt? Well, <clears throat> some of the reason I'm wearing this is so that when people see me, they'll recognize me as somebody that is part of the organization, part of the Stars Club. <clears throat> Even though I'm not like on the payroll, no one's going to check my paycheck. But I'm wearing a Stars polo so that people can see that I'm working and not just a fan. So they don't get, so they, they let me go into different places. Oh. Because what I want to do is I'm going to get down on the field. On the field? Mm-hmm. Why? So I can set my mics up a little bit further away from the crowd. Wait, what is it about your mics just moving around? Well, I've got, I'm bringing enough mics that I don't want to be carrying them in my hands. So, I so you have a giant bag. Mm-hmm. Right, but where are you going to set it up? Well, I have to find my spot. That's why i got to get there early. I walk around carrying all my gear until I find a spot that I like, that they will actually let me sit down and record. Wait. Well, the winter season, I'm definitely going to a new kind of class. What are you going? Skate class. You want to go skating? Okay. I never really skate. That's why I don't know how too much. How do we learn? Practice. That's right. Grab a topo chico. Here, boy, I'm going to go. Okay. Love you. Give me a kiss. Mwah. Be good. Remember when Mama says to stop, it's time to stop, okay? Love you. Have a good day. All right. 
road to the Winter Classic. <clears throat> All right, let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. Car cast today. So last night was New Year's Eve and I went to bed at a normal hour. I did not stay up and ring in the New Year because I knew I was going to need lots of rest, lots of energy for my day today. I have spent the last couple of days just kind of slowly and meticulously putting my rig together and checking everything out. Um, part of the rig for an all-day outdoor sports crowd recording like this is the clothes that I'm wearing. So I've got long johns on underneath and on top. Now, it's going to be a gorgeous day for a hockey game today. Right now it's 45 degrees. It's going to be about highs in the 50s or so by game time. So it's not going to be much different from what it is now. But because I'm going to be stationary, I'm not going to be moving around. I'm going to make sure that I've got enough layers on to where I'm going to be comfortable all day. So long johns under the pants. Long shirt under my regular shirt. And I'm wearing a black Dallas Stars polo t-shirt. And I've also got my Dallas Stars credential, even though it's not going to be worth much in the arena because this isn't oh, in the arena at the stadium because this is a NHL event it's not a Dallas Stars event lots of warm clothes I'm going to be passing by the office on the way to the train so my way in is I'm going to drive from my house which is out in the mid-city suburbs of Grapevine down to a park and ride train station that's relatively close to the Cotton Bowl Stadium. The reason is because parking is all pre-sold out. And so I'm just gonna have to make do. So my rig that I put together has to be portable enough to where I can cart it around a pretty long distance from my car to my final resting spot and back. So speaking of the rig, <clears throat> challenges were, hey, it's a one, once in a lifetime opportunity. So, I can't really take too many heavy risks with regards to things like wind protection, um, mic selection, etc. If this was something that I could get to, you know, repeatedly, then I would try all kinds of different mic and wind protection setups. And sometimes I would probably swing for the fences with regards to, you know, double ORTF or things like that you know, kind of putting, risking putting mics up in the air without blimps um, in order to gain wider stereo separation. But given that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, I really can't risk not bringing a blimp or not using a blimp in an outdoor environment. So that limits my primary mic choice and even my polar patterns after some consideration, what I ended up going with was a Sheps double MS rig that all fits inside of one Rycote blimp, the MS blimp, with the primary advantages of that being that you can take a double MS recording, decode it out to 5.0 or 5.1, really 5.0, or into any other kind of flat surround formats. If I wanted to just make a quad decode, I could. And it's super easy to just extract a natural stereo decode that's not even a down mix. It's just the, the, the forward MS mics. So it's a little bit of a tighter sound, especially for things like crowds, than I would default to. But it's going to be bulletproof. It's going to be rock solid. There's just no way for me to really mess it up. 
So there's that. So I'm gonna take that as my primary rig. Secondary supplemental mics are my Crown PCM 60s. PCM mics are just amazing for crowds. And for this particular situation, the crowns are uniquely well suited because they don't require wind protection, they don't require microphone stands, and they don't take up any space. So I can put the entirety of everything I need to record my crowns in like a two inch space of height and about four inches wide, and I'm there. Um, which is huge, right? So I can use those to supplement the double MS rig and add a whole bunch of width to the image. In orchestral recordings, it's super common to add omni flanking mics to a primary decatree array in order to capture everything. So this is kind of my poor man's version of that where I've got my rock solid center hang rig and my flankers that in post, I can work pretty hard to phase align them, EQ match them if I need to, and, and just kind of push them into the space and see what happens. So that's five channels. Double MS rig is three, a couple of Crown PZM 60Ds, is four or five. I'm also bringing, as a separate supplement, a pair of Sennheiser 416s. Now, I got this note a little bit from Watson Wu when I was chatting on the field recording Slack about what rig I should be putting together. When Watson chimed in with the idea of bringing some shotguns, it made a lot of sense to me. And the reason, there's a couple of reasons. One, shotguns are gonna give me a totally different sound than everything else. And two, because I'm gonna have a relatively small physical footprint, shotguns might be a way for me to reach out into the crowd and capture some other details that close perspective, wide pattern, cardioids and figure eights and omnis are just not going to hear. So just by the nature of the polar pattern, I'm extending my footprint, which is really nice without actually like physically extending my footprint. I've run shotguns in a similar configuration in the past when we were doing our Porsche recordings. We had almost this exact setup. We had the Sheps MS rig, for the, for the pass bys, which sounded amazing. And then flanking the MS rig, we had MKH 60s shooting up and down the track. And what that really allowed us to do was capture long approaches and long passes with a solid center pass um, because the shotguns were just reaching out and catching a bunch of details way far out on the edges of the MS rig. Um, and it sounded beautiful. It just worked great. So conceptually, I feel like this could be really nice. Now from a signal flow standpoint, I had to work with the gear that I had. I felt it was very, very important to capture as many channels as I could in 32-bit floating point. A, again, because it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and I can't risk any distortion or clipping. And B, because what I've found a lot lately with 32-bit is that in addition to never clipping, you gain the benefit of being able to reach way down into the basement of some of the sounds and pull them way up and have perfect resolution. So when things are quiet, really, really quiet, if I want to, I can reach on down there and grab that stuff and yank it up and use it. And it'll sound like I had recorded at that gain stage, which is a big deal. So, I don't have seven channels, 
of 32-bit recording. I've got my Mix Pre 6 Mark II, and I had to decide how I wanted to approach my signal flow. So my colleague, Steve, also has a Mix Pre 6, and he let me borrow his. His is not the, not the Mark II. His is the one that was the first generation. So what I'm doing is, I'm running the Sheps MS rig, three channels directly into my Mark II. Then I'm gonna take the PZMs, run them into channels one and two of Steve's Mark I rig, and route those out the aux output of Steve's Mark I, and then into the aux input of my Mark II. So that's five channels. Now I'm gonna lose the benefit of the multiple gain staging on the preamps that way. So the way I'm gonna compensate for that is by just setting my preamps on the Mark I for those first two channels. Pretty stupidly soft. With the game plan of going into my 32-bit recordings and yanking them back up to where I need them to go. And I'll still have the original 24-bit on the Mark I as well. I'll find a spot. The one thing I can't do is clip. As long as I don't clip on the front end of the Mark I on those two channels, I'll be super happy. So the other two channels, which will be the PZMs, will just go into the Mark I and live there because I don't have enough more input channels into the Mark II. And the Mix Pre 6 only has a stereo aux out. <laughs> so there's that. So we spent a, a ton of time in the week leading up to this, just kind of testing that proof of concept, setting the presets. With, with the Mix Pre recorders, you really, really have to build and lock down your presets. So we spent a lot of time just setting the presets and setting the workflow and making sure everything was gonna work the way I thought it was gonna work. I feel real solid about it right now. The other thing is obviously power. So we're powering both with USB-C batteries, with RAF power batteries, and then I have a spare uh, power as well. In my usage with the Mix Pre's, I've found that one of those RAV powers can run me all day with no issues at all. So I feel confident about that. Especially given that I have some spares. And really, when you're running a long time gig like this, it's just utterly unworkable to try and swap double A's or anything else like that. It's just not going to happen. I am going to have to swap cards on my on my main rig at some point because I've only got 32 gig SD cards and the really nice thing about the sound devices and about most modern recorders is they will auto calculate how much time you have based on your number of channels and recording space etc. So I'm only going to have about four hours per card on my main rig. And you know, a hockey game lasts about four hours. This one's gonna have a lot of pop and circumstance and I'm gonna wanna catch a lot of before and after as well. And you know, just the the 32 bit takes 33% more data. So it all starts getting eaten up. You start adding channels together. I'm here at the office now. I'm gonna drop off one thing, grab one more thing. Last minute stuff that I thought of last night. Cart. I had brought a cart initially. And then Steve said, I had the suggestion of just using a rolling suitcase. Given that I needed to be more mobile and a little bit less conspicuous. And that actually is going to work out great for me. So I'm just dropping the cart back. Grabbing one more mic clip in case I need it. Work happens to be on the way to the train station, so no big deal.
So yeah, I'm gonna have to pick a spot to swap cards. And I think, you know, obvious spaces to swap cards are during an emissions when the PA tends to be running. We also looked into sample accurate syncing the two devices. But that would require, I think, both of them to be reading HDMI timecode generated from a camera. So it wasn't really feasible for what I did or what my setup is. So I'll just have to clap sync. And um, I hope that works out okay. Walk in here and grab one thing. So that's that. So I'm going to drive down to the park and ride, hop the train, run the train to Fair Park, roll over to the main building, get my media credential, maybe ask a couple of questions, and uh, go find a place to get set up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go to the check ins. Okay. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Picking up a credential? Yes, ma'am. Can I see your ID? You guys have heat in here. I know. <laughs> I didn't yesterday. Oh, my gosh. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, looks like I don't have a picture of you on file. Okay. So if you want to come around the corner, Frankie will take your photo and print your Yes, ma'am. Okay. You're going to look right here. Count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> you oh, said three. Sorry, it got delayed. Okay, ready? Try it again. One, two, three. Don't use that first one. I will. <laughs> Alright, got my potential. Walking in. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I'll help you with all that. Yeah, I had to ride the train just for the experience of it. Did you, man? It was. Before you had to come. Uh, I just parked at Inwood Station and came up here. Oh, okay. So you just caught one train. Yeah. I just caught one, <laughs> but it was nuts though. <laughs> There's a lot of people on the train. That was the first time. Uh, you know, when it's in a big event, I kind of like getting in there. Yeah, not too bad. <laughs> um, all right, so I need to get down to the field. Down on the field. Yes, sir. Go hit that street right there. Mm -hmm. Just follow it all the way around. It's okay. gonna take you all the way around to the ramp. Okay. The ramp will take you down on the field. Thank you, sir. You're gonna pass by all the TV trucks and everything. Okay. Just keep on going. Right? Thank you. All my contacts. All your contacts. Well, I'm not in your contacts. Well, we'll put you in there. Four, uh, four and six. I'll sit down with four. So. Can you, can you, can you I'm going to be going the wrong way. I'm trying to get out to the field. Can you do M as well? One. Okay. So y'all on three M on one. I'm going to M right now. 
One or three? Okay, three. I have okay. one, four, uh, six, and seven. Anybody so, else going somewhere else? Uh, uh, three M. Three M. So rows are down to support. Uh, okay, that's me. this so is way, one. If you are going to the field, this is where you would get off. Thank you. She said through the door and down the stairs. Hi. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm here with the stars just to record the crowds. Okay. I'm looking for a place where I could be out of the way that I could just sit and park. Who who are you reporting to from the NHL this time? Just like if they don't like ideally they should put you in a bib. Okay. If you're gonna be on field anywhere. And anywhere I put you back here, you're gonna hear me yelling at people more than you're gonna hear. Well, the honestly, I mean, during during the gameplay, obviously the PA is not going. That's mostly what I'm getting, right? So I'm not worried so much about PA. Um, because um, I'm just gonna cut all that out and post. You know what I mean? Well, if you could just circle back with the through through the media channels okay. about on field during the game because the nature of like any media element that's not in a bib like the guys up top will be like who's that guy what's he doing that's fair so if there's no no i just got to text the crew's the band's 40 minutes late the crew's pulling up right now <laughs> the, and the, the band's 40 minutes late in the air like the principals so but they have landed they're saying right um, I might find a spot in the concourse then. I definitely. Um, like, I don't... You know what, actually? Here's what you can do. You can actually park yourself in the bleachers. Okay. See where the sea kill has a, a, a one-foot bench? Yep. Just park yourself on any one of those benches. I guarantee you that's not a sold seat. Love it. That's what i Because the manifest closes that off. So gotcha. park yourself there. Uh, I'm assuming you're not putting a boom up tall, though, right? I mean, I, I do have a boom. I can put it as you know as you short. Can't block as anybody's want. sight lines. Sure. So whatever you do, like if if you're going to sit right there and monitor, and you want to put a mic stand right here, you can do that all day long. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. I'm so I mean I've got that guy. That's all I got. Right? Yeah. So, I just like it can't like even my antennas and stuff. I can't be higher than people's sight lines. Sure. Understood. So okay. Yeah. So I'll stay low. Maybe I'll be on the second row right here in this little corner right here. Okay. And just keep it bearish. Cool. All right. Thank you, man. I appreciate no it. I have a spot. I have a spot. Very excited about it. Dude, I have a front row goddamn seat. All right. Okay, so what happened? Well, so I did all that heavy negotiating to find my spot and I ended up in a really nice angle down at one corner behind the stage. And I was actually right in front of the PA. And you know, the Cotton Bowl is an interesting place because there's not a built-in PA in that stadium. It's just a big, old, old stadium. And so they, they rolled the PA in there and everything was down on the field shooting up at the crowds. And my position was way down low and out by one of the end zones in front of one of the speaker stacks and probably about 30 feet from the pyro. And the pyro guys are hilarious because, you know, they're all setting up and they're pointing out everything and, you know, all the all the people in the that are working for the band are shuffling stage parts in and out and the pyro guys are there like hey look all of that is wired and live and, and just don't come within about 18 feet of it or it'll blow your eyebrows off and they're just like the most hardcore guys ever and so i take my time and i get all set up i shoot the ms rig up at the crowd I put the 
four sixteens almost exactly below the rig, shooting out kind of in an ORTF angle. And then I drop the Crown PZMs on the bleachers right next to everything. So my footprint ended up being pretty narrow, but at the same time, my microphone angles ended up being really, really nice and wide and, and had a whole lot of coverage, given what my footprint was. As the crew is bustling about, but the doors aren't open yet, and we're doing sound check. Sound check was actually a really good equilibrium for me to get levels, although because I'm recording at 32-bit, levels were just not really an issue. Um, and I gotta say, when I came back into post, 32-bit ended up being a huge deal. The gates open. The crowd starts flowing in and you look up at it and as somebody that's been in the American Airlines Center as 18,000 fans stream in and set up, to look up at 85,000 fans, it's pretty dramatic and you almost, you almost sit and count how many games it would take to host that many fans that you're looking at all at once. And they're streaming in, and they're streaming in, and and at some point, we get ready for the national anthem. And the national anthem is really where the whole 32-bit situation became a big deal. So from a signal flow perspective, I had the three channels of Sheps, which was the double MS rig going straight into my Mixpre 6.2. And then I had the two 416s going into my co-workers original mix pre 6 1 and coming straight out the aux out into my mix pre 6 2. so those mics actually got recorded twice once at 24 bit on the old mix pre and then again at 32 bit on my mix pre and consequently i knew i was going to have to level set those particular channels on the front end very very conservatively and i could do that confidently because I know at 32 bit I can just reach down into the depths of the earth and bring sounds back up from the dead. So I kept all those levels set pretty conservatively. With that said, I mean, I've been recording at 24 bit for a long time, so I can do 24 bit and not clip. But man, I gotta tell you, when that national anthem went, When those 85,000 fans did the Stars National Anthem bit, it was just a bigger sound than you ever get with 18,000 fans at the American Airlines Center. And everybody in the arena felt it. When that first Stars went up, you could look around and you could see everybody's eyes were getting big and wide. And they held it a little bit longer, and it was just the hair was standing up on the back of your neck because it was just the coolest thing. And then, of course, I'm 20 feet from the pyro. So that moment comes, and the pyro goes. And that's where I used up every one of my 32 bits. The crowd kept chanting and the pyro kept going. And there was the big flyover at the end. They were using prop planes to fly over. And it was just the most epic, real-life national anthem that I've ever been a part of in my entire life. 
It was just stinking cool. And everybody knew it. It was a spectacle on the level of the Super Bowl. Then the fans are chanting and the puck is dropped and we're off. And it was a weird first period because new Dallas Star and old Dallas Star enemy Corey Perry did the most Corey Perry thing he could possibly do and elbowed a guy in the jaw and got kicked out right at the beginning of the game. Took a five minute major. And then I think it was Cogliano chucked a puck over the boards, took another minor penalty. And all of a sudden you're down two men early. And the Stars have been just a very streaky hockey team this year. They're either world beaters or they're getting destroyed seven to nothing. And when Perry took that penalty and the crowd let the refs have it, That was some of the best booing I've ever captured in my career. Dallas penalty number 10, Corey Perry. A five minute major for elbowing and a game misconduct. Penalty to be served by number 47, Alexander Radulov. That's Perry, five for elbowing and a game misconduct. But in the end, Nashville scored a couple of times. And you look up and you see that you're down two to nothing, your team's not playing well, and it was in real danger of getting away from you. And it's cold, and you're on national TV, and you're a little bit embarrassed for your team. National power play goal has ninth of the season, score number 95, Matt Duchesne, assisted by number 9, Philip Forsberg, and number 59, Roman Yossi. And the place started really feeling like a mortuary with 85,000 people just watching their team stink it up. One minute in the first period. So the period ends, they go to break. The poor NHL hype guy is doing his best to hype everybody up and they're doing the rodeo thing. But everyone in the stadium is sitting there just not feeling great about themselves. Second period comes around. And the stars start doing some good things, but nothing's really going in the net. And then as some miracle, some break happens, and all of a sudden we score. And when we scored, it was the most massive crowd react that I could have possibly hoped for. Because it wasn't one of those goals that you see coming. It wasn't a breakaway that, that somebody was streaking down the ice. It was a bang, bang turnover. And all of a sudden, bam, we scored and we're back in the game. Funny thing about the score is that about a month in advance of the game, the Stars came up to me and they asked me if I had a recording of the Stars' goal horn. And of course I did, because I'm in there recording all the time. And I had gone to the American Airlines Center years ago. And just in one opportunity before there was a game, like during the daytime, I had my rig all set up and I just asked him to blow the horn. And so I got a whole bunch of super, super clean horn blasts of the star's goal horn in the arena with no crowd in it. So 
So that's what I sent to the league, and that's what they actually played through the PA when we scored outside because they weren't actually going to haul the horn down there. And the big difference there is that at the American Airlines Center, with 18,000 people on their feet going nuts, the horn still dramatically overwhelms the sound of the crowd. It's just incredibly loud. But at the Cotton Bowl, with 85,000 people, and not a real horn, the horn only coming through the PA, the crowd overwhelmed the horn by a lot. It was a totally flip-flopped experience, and it was just wild for somebody that knows what it usually sounds like when you score a home goal. I'm sure that's a difficult thing to translate over the podcast, but that really, it was really a, a different ratio. It was the exact opposite of what you're used to hearing. And again, everyone's eyes are big and they're all looking around going, this is a lot of us and this is cool. And from that moment, the stars turned it on. All of a sudden, they're dramatically outplaying the Predators. They're skating up and down the ice. Preds are taking penalties. Fans are chanting. And now it's getting out of hand and we score again. And every time we scored, it's like you weren't cold anymore. And you're not embarrassed for the team anymore. And you're standing up and you're high-fiving strangers. And everybody is really, really living in the moment. And just perceiving how cool and how special this really is. It was just the most storybook game you could ever hope for. It was the perfect script. It was some of the best recordings I've made in my life. All the gear did exactly what I would hoped it would do. The Sheps, bright, punchy, in your face. The 416s reaching out into the balconies and pulling those people in with me. The Crown PZMs give me all the low end. They give me the air and they give me the low end. The fact that I didn't have anybody within 50 feet of my mics. So I got a nice even wash with no individual voices sticking out too hard. The perfect positioning and the beautiful, beautiful mix coming through the PA. And the entire rig fit in one suitcase that I was able to portage from my car 20 miles away to the train and then through the group of people and through security and down the stairs, because there's no elevator, and down to the field, and then back. It was a top five life experience for me.
it was something I'll never forget. It was something I really, really had to fight to be a part of. In the end, it's something that I'm super proud of, and I feel very lucky and privileged to have had the opportunity to go experience, much less record. It was cool. I loved it. And, you know, we're walking away and everybody's sitting there going, man, we should do this every year, maybe every five years. And I kind of disagree with that. I knew when they announced it a year ago that this was going to be a once in a lifetime thing. And it was. And I don't expect it ever to come around like that again. Thumbbenders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. 